Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is our second pre-conference keynote for the Gaming and Education Conference, the inaugural 2014 Gaming and Ed Conference that is going on for four days here. Uh, we're so excited to have Ron Stuckey with us tonight. Ron, we moved you from another time that was less convenient. I'm actually really glad that you're you're doing this in our time tonight. Uh, morning for you, right? Yes, yes, very convenient for me. I'm so glad. Thanks so much to Brain Pop and the ASB Online Academy for supporting this Brain Pop. And Allison Levy is our co-chair for the conference. Really appreciate the tremendous support and collaboration that has been involved in pulling this conference together. Thanks to Blackboard Collaborate for this oh so stable and terrific platform. This is a chance for those of you who are watching live to indicate where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map. You're looking for the star icon. Click on that probably twice. And then click on the map to let us know where you are. I'm normally not on the West Coast, but today I am. Looks like Allison just came in the room. Allison, you missed the nice, uh, my kudos to you and appreciation. But thanks to Allison and Brain Pop for all of that support again. Do shout out in the chat and let us know where you're participating from. And please continue to do that as we move forward, even though we move away from the map. Bron, it's yours. I'm here as your wingman. Let me know how I can help. And I'll watch the chat for questions if that's helpful to you. Are you there, Bronwyn? Sorry, yeah, I was getting a Julie with microphone on, so they were writing me. Never mind. Moving on. Um, I'm going to talk today about what I'm calling game-inspired learning, and a lot of people use the term gamification. Um, it, it seems to have a lot of baggage, particularly with educators, because uh, people see um, some very um, trivial um, exercises carried out, perhaps not in the best interest of learning under the banner of gamification. And so um, people are using lots of different terms. I've, I've chosen game inspired, but um, game infused is another one that is very popular and game framed, all of which imply that you're not designing a game. You're actually looking at um, what games have, what, what, what talents or, or affordances games have, and then how we can employ some of those in our um, teaching and learning contexts. Um, and what I'm going to propose to you today is this, this new frame or this new um, imagining should be a chance to change on a deep level what it is we do in our classrooms. Um, and I'm glad to see people were putting in the comments their interests in teaching and learning, and many of those are about um, reform or, or reframing things. So that's great to know. Um, and, and as you can tell from my accent, I'm in Sydney, Australia, but I do a lot of work on a global context. And I worked for uh, 10 years with the Quest Atlantis program out of Indiana University and now the um, Atlantis Remix project out of um, Arizona State University. Um, so I consult to a lot of different projects around games and community, and that's probably the the, the big thing in my uh, bag of tricks at the moment. Um, I, what I'm going to try to do today is to kind of power through the slides so we can have a really good conversation. Um, so I want to try and give you a snapshot of some things. Um, the slides are all very visual and, I, and I'll talk to them. Um, and if you want to follow up on anything, I'm more than happy to do so in, uh, in other form, forums. But I'd really like to have a conversation. I know Tony, for instance, has a room full of... Um, teacher ed students in his room and I'd love to be hearing the conversation um, that, that he and his students and all of you have. So let's try and get through this quickly and then have room for lots of conversation. So what is gamification? 
and uh, what is game inspired learning, um, moving away from that term. And it's, it's fairly simple, um, it's applying um, game attributes, or I prefer the term um, atoms, which Sebastian Desiding proposed, game atoms, to non-game contexts. And so this, this image pretty much tells the story of, of what we're trying to do. So we're thinking about what it is games have, what atoms do they hold, and how can we, uh, how can we use those as part of our tool set um, to rethink what it is we do in teaching and learning. So it's not game design. We're not going to become game designers, and I think that's a really important point to make. We're not going to turn all of learning into a game. Um, and I think, you know, this is adding to our tool set, um, as it were, if we've got our industrial tool belt on, as Amy Jo Kim likes to suggest as a visual, then we're slipping in a whole sequence of new tools that we've got um, for our teaching and learning. But what I want to propose is that adding that new set of tools should be an opportunity to rethink more than superficial things. So it's more than just adding points, leaderboards and badges to what you already do. It should be an opportunity to rethink uh, and reframe what it is you do. And, and to question even the biggest and deepest attributes of the teaching and learning context. Um, you'll hear a lot of this. Um, everyone, uh, oh, jump the slide. Gamification, let's do it. You know, it's the must have addition to any project. Or as uh, Phaedra Boindris from uh, IBM suggested, it's the obligatory frosting that people are dropping onto their projects these days. And, um, you know, we want to avoid doing that. We really want to make sure that if we're making change in our teaching and learning, that that it comes from the best of reasons and it's not just adding the newest, latest, sexy thing to, um, to what we do. So, but we do want to think about large scale change, not, not necessarily small change. So let's avoid that. Let's avoid the whole gamification because it should be something uh, we need, to, we need to do. And, I want to talk about need as the, as the reason for trying a game-inspired uh, approach to your teaching and learning. And, I, and I'm just playing with this idea of signals, uh, which I pulled from, uh, was inspired by Jane McGonigal's talk, and she uses a lot of uh, imagery about signals. And I think the, these are the signals I find in the examples I'm going to show you today. So signaling a need um, where the topic signals a need. So the topic itself is not intrinsically interesting to students, but it's something they really need to have. And we're going to have a look at the Grammar Olympics by Amy Baskin um, for that, uh, for topic signals. Um, learner signals are where we might be dealing with switched off learners who um, have, have not had success in a traditional learning context and um, have lost their love of learning. And how can we bring that back to them? And so there is a space there that we can play with. Engagement signals where we might be wanting to give learners the experience um, that successful learners have or uh, an experience of community that they may not have had before. And then context signals where an initiative or a reform signals a need. Um, and so we might be diving into some change in our curriculum, in our practice, in our technology, and that may signal a need for us to consider a new approach. But we always want to be working from a need and having goals and keeping those goals in sight because much and all of technology can be seductive. Um, the concept of gamification or, or game-inspired learning can also be seductive and may lead you down a path that you're not necessarily um, of, of benefit to our learners. So a few things about a, a game-inspired approach, um, it needs to be an opt-in, opt-out situation. Learners need to be able to um, be part of it if they choose to. It can't be compulsory. Um, and that's a really interesting point. It's a point about games. You have to choose to engage in the game. It needs to be fun. So it needs to offer uh, um, 
all the different kinds of fun and um, and I'm not going to go into those here, but hard fun is one of those that Seymour Papert um, termed. But there are many other social fun and other kinds of fun that, that people can engage in. It's not necessarily just about pleasurable experience because fun comes in a number of different packages. And it has to allow for user choice. People need to be able to make their own choices and as part of the whole self-determination theory that sits behind a lot of gaming, um, people need to make choice of tasks. So what tasks do they want to engage with? And then pathways through the learning. So to map their own trajectory through through the learning space. And that's all of those you'll see in examples I'm going to give. Um, so I hope, uh, I hope that's uh, a basic platform for why we're thinking about um, game-inspired learning. So the first example I want to talk about is the Grammar Olympics. And the link there um, is to uh, a video where Amy Baskin at the Gamification Summit in 2013 explained uh, why she brought this uh, Olympics into the college where she works in, um, in Florida State College at Jacksonville. And grammar is really important to these students in terms of their capability to graduate um, in, from their courses. And yet we all know grammar is not the most interesting of topics necessarily that they might be engaging in. And so Amy devised a series of activities um, fun, physical, it's very low tech, it's not digital, it's low cost and got all the uh, faculty to engage with it. And you can see in this picture there's a physical activity here related to a grammar task or a, grammar, a piece of grammar learning. And um, students had a game card and they were able to um, engage in various tasks um, using their knowledge of grammar and, and reinforcing their knowledge of grammar and collect um, stickers as they went along and the end game of it was completing their game card would allow them to earn a gold medal because it's the Olympics. Now, you might think, okay, these are college students and they engaged in this sort of physical, fun little game. And if you watch the video, you'll see many of the students giving a response to how much fun it was and the pride in which they felt even in just earning their little gold medal and just getting to recognise um, they already knew quite a lot of the grammar, but there was more to learn. And I think that's a really great concept. Uh, it wasn't going to teach them all the grammar they were going to need, but it was giving them, and, and Peggy used the word, and it's one of my favourites, a disposition towards this topic that was a little more positive than what, what they might have um, had originally. And so you can see here Amy describing um, how, why she felt this was effective. Um, and I would recommend you go look at that video. It's only like 15 minutes, but if you wanted to look at a very fun um, and engaging way to get even some pretty hardened students to think grammar was cool, um, then it's really worthwhile. So I'm going to jump through that quickly. I don't want to... Uh, I want to give you all the examples. Now the second example, the Velvet Throne, is a program devised by a teacher here in Australia, Natalie Denmead. And Natalie works in the gamification area as well. Um, and I, I will have contacts for all of the people whose projects I'm showing you at the end. So I do have a way for you to get in contact with all of them to follow up. Um, now Natalie has um, a great topic because she's working in digital media and that's the subject that she's teaching. But she's working with students in, in what's called TAFE in Australia which is um, perhaps um, community college but it's really um, further education in the trades. Um, and she's in a country town in the town of Tari and you can see here um, this is some of the graphics. These are all the graphics you can see here devised by her students. So she had a curriculum for studying digital media, but she had students who had not, a, not, not been turned on by traditional learning. So in many cases, they were um, they're beyond the compulsory years of schooling, so they've chosen to do this subject, but they're really not excited about learning. They haven't been switched on. Um, 
And so she took a different approach to a topic that was already quite um, appealing to them because they'd signed up for the subject, but to give them a way into the learning um, that would really get them to engage, to be sociable, and um, to really get to know each other and each other's strengths. And so she took a Game of Thrones approach to, um, to the topic and the students formed uh, houses and you can see there they're all wanting to rule over Terrestros and um, that's the town, Tari, and they had guilds and the guilds related to the content that they were going to be studying, so movie making, photography, game design, 2D, 3D animation and so on. And so those were the guilds, so they had a house and then they also had guilds that moved across, um, across those. And this is played out over 14 hours of study in a semester in the, in the college. And remembering these kids are in a country town and there's 16 plus age groups. So I think 16 to uh, um, mid, mid 20s, I think, the age of the students taking this course. And so you can read there a little bit more about the background and the framing of it. Um, and each week there was a, a winning house. Um, and the guilds uh, learnt skills and then taught each other. So there was a lot of um, becoming the expert and then helping others to learn that topic. Um, very, very positively framed. Um, and uh, each, as I said, each week there was a, a learning, a, a winning house. And that was framed such that um, each house had a turn at being the winner in, in a way and achievements were set um, for that week. And there were points and, and associated other attributes. Now the exciting thing about this is Natalie's actually attained a grant to um, take some of the winning students to New Zealand to go to where they filmed um, the, the Hobbit and some of the other activities that are there. So this is a really exciting um, thing that's come out of that, but it wasn't actually part of it when she started out. It was actually trying to switch learners who've been browned off by the education system onto, onto learning. And this has proven to be very successful. So this is really beautiful, a lot of work, but it was developing on the fly. She didn't have it all mapped out how it was going to work. She just knew this might be a great way to go. And in fact, Natalie herself had never ever watched Game of Thrones. She was forced to do it by the students who said she couldn't come in, she couldn't be part of it if she didn't watch some of it. So, um, but it was pretty easy to see. She's picked up game game elements there, the whole notion of guilds um, and points and achievements are part of uh, that program. If you want to know more about that, you'll be able to follow up with Natalie. I'll give you her details. So that's the Velvet Throne. Now Just Press Play is out of the Rochester Institute of Technology School of Interactive Games and Media. And this is a really interesting program because the need here was um, to give students the experience that highly successful students have. Um, and so they mapped out what was it that highly successful students in this program did and then created a game inspired system around that. Now just to go back, the need here is that there's a lot of evidence that students at university, um, that the attrition rate is, in, is linked to their connectedness how connected they feel to the program they're in, to the students around them, to the campus they're part of, to the town that they're living in. And so um, at the bottom of this Just Press Play is a very strong agenda to build community. And so it's a load of fun activities that the students engage in in their undergraduate, as it says, undergraduate daily life. Um, and it's, it's uh, well researched and well planned and Professor Elizabeth Lawley is the person um, who has been overseeing and designing it to her brainchild and uh, it's an exemplary piece of game inspired learning. So it's built around and those create, learn, socialise, explore and loosely based off Bartle's four player types and the students need to collect or, or carry out tasks in each of the four quadrants. And the interesting thing here is they, it's not attached to their assessable tasks. So this is a layer of social engagement, of connectedness that they're uh, attempting to build out of Just Press Play. 
And the students have a personalised QR code and when they attend activities and events, um, that, that's scanned and they're automatically then recorded. Um, each of the staff members has the QR code reader on their phone and that is automatically recorded on the system. And what sort of things do students do? Well, they might be um, asked to recreate an image from a famous picture or famous photograph. Um, because this is media studies, they do try to fold in activities that are, uh, that, that are part of the study, but they're not accessible tasks. They might be doing, um, and I know in the past they ran flash mobs and all sorts of other fun activities, um, but the thing that really interests me is the engagement with the faculty. So things like going to office hours, um, of a, the consultation hours of your professor. Um, is a really important thing. And we know that successful students aren't too shy to go to the professor and ask for help. Um, having taught um, in the university sector myself, I know some of my most successful students were those ones who would come along and want to talk about it as something they were grappling with. Um, and so getting students to go along and do that, visit the, visit the professor, make that professor a human being that they, are, uh, they see as approachable. Um, they have um, have your photograph taken with the dean, and um, and that was a really fun experience. Something that the dean himself actually enjoyed doing, and missed when there were days when students didn't come along. Or find your professor in the wild, because this is a university town. So you're looking at perhaps seeing your professor at a football game or somewhere else, and just saying hello. You're not stalking the professor, but it's just again adding that layer of um, personal to the context of the, of the campus. It's getting to know the campus itself and being able to understand the workings of the library and the media areas. Um, it's also getting to know and associate with um, lots of other people outside of your immediate cohort in, in the college. And what it does become in the end for the students is a map of the memories of their years in the program. So this uh, Just Press Play is designed to be across the whole of their undergraduate period. Um, and so the things that they've recorded, there'll be photos, videos, audio, YouTube, any kind of media. This will be a map of the fun things they've done and associated with over the course of their studies. And that's a really beautiful thing. So let's just press play. And they do give away, they will be giving away the um, infrastructure so if you wanted to pick that up and run that in your own environment, um, they will be able to share that um, with, with other places who may want to research um, and follow along. Mission Possible is um, a program out of Bettendorf High School and now this was where a context or, or initiative in the school I mean, a, a reform was going to have a high impact on the school and the teachers. And so this was, the school was going one-to-one -one iPad. And so it was, um, and this program has run now for, it's quite mature, it's run for over three years. It was the brainchild of the science teacher in the school, um, Chris Like, and um, she went to the head and said, I have this great idea that we could run some game-inspired game professional learning for the teachers that will help them be, be more capable in using their iPads. And so he devised a 10-level a system uh, of missions. So it's, it's challenge-based or mission-based. And the teachers engage um, at level two, you've gained your iPad. So you get your school-offered iPad at level two. And then beyond that, you go through a sequence of ever increasingly more complex missions um, to create your professional status in using that tool. So for instance, at level four, there, there may be 40 or 50 missions, and you only have to do um, a certain number of those to gain your points. So you have lots of choices of what you can engage in. And most of the missions centre around the school endorsed tools. So if it's uh, Twitter or Nodo, um, social tools for the teachers, um, and different tools they're using in the school. At, after level four, you, you actually, part of your missions is to create new missions in the system. So it employs a really well thought out system of participatory design. 
where um, you know the teachers themselves are picking areas of their own interest and devising missions to um, to go inside that. As you move up in the levels, you're you're giving back to your school and to your colleagues by devising new missions. But at very top levels, you're giving back to um, your profession and promoting the school to the outside world. So, for instance, at level ten, you're you will be looking to give a presentation or publish a paper or something on your use of iPads in the school. And that's actually how I learned about this program. I, I met a young teacher, Shannon Retta, who was giving a presentation at SITE about her, um, her level 10, and she was talking about her um, special education uh, teaching with iPads. So it's a very well-devised, well-structured professional program, but it's done in such a fun way. Um, and you know the, the missions are all posed. They're not posed in curriculum language. They're fun. They're engaging. They're, they're gameful. They're cheeky, and um, and uh, and very well received by the teachers in the school. You don't have to engage in it, um, and but teachers are. And if I move on to the next screen, you'll we'll see a little bit of what's involved for them. And this is all running Google tools, so it's very simple. Um, and if you were to contact Chris, he would be very happy to give you any of what they've um, built to to uh, make it. Now, the reason I'm showing you this slide is I've taken the names of the teachers off, but you can see the kinds of um, titles they're earning as they do a sequence um, on uh, of missions. And the school gets little prizes, and they hold those off and give them um, as as little extra tchotchkes and things for teachers along the way. And educators, we all know, we, we go to conferences and, and we collect all those tchotchkes, so people do like them. But you'll see things like becoming the Edmodo Dragon or the Tweenius. And the interesting thing about those is they're titles that you earn when you complete the full sequence of something, uh, of missions related to, for instance, um, Twitter or Edmodo. Now, what's interesting about that is they're starting to see people going to each other for expertise, rather than going to the IT team for assistance. So new, uh, new experts are emerging out of this system in the school, and it's building a really healthy community between the teachers. So that's a really uh, another fantastic effort. The next one is Plain, which is a community I um, worked with. It was a federally funded project here in Australia and um, was designed to improve the use of information and communication technology in teaching and learning. And so it's uh, from pre-service through to university teaching um, in K-12, right across the board, in, in our TAFE sec sector of further education. Um, the program was uh, had masses of content within it, so it had games devised within it, had professional courses, it had community spaces and forums. So that it's a very huge space. It was a, a, a big project under our digital education revolution um, of the previous government, and that's important in a minute, and I'll tell you why. Um, but we decided that because community is really important here, and we know, those of you, and I look down this list, I know how connected all of the people attending this session are, that, that connectedness is really important to our professional learning. And we wanted to give teachers that experience in this community. And having worked in communities of practice for the last 15 years, I know that in a lot of cases, um, we're pretty pragmatic as teachers. We want to come in, grab what we need, leave, and we might look around at the community later. Well, and sometimes later never happens. Um, so what we so what we devised was a program that would um, onboard the teachers into the community and give them a taste of what goodness was in here, what benefits they would have for their professional learning by being an active member of the community. And so the game program in here, the, the game inspired process, is a 10, 10 levels. And uh, you start as a hero. It's loosely based on Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey. And so you start as a hero. And we have a little narrative behind that because and I firmly do believe teaching is a heroic journey. I was a, a practicing elementary teacher for, for many years. And um, 
We give teachers the experience of the community. What is it they're going to be able to do in here through that game-inspired mission? And at level five, if you're um, attaining to that, you get to be a ninja teacher. I mean, who wouldn't want to be a ninja teacher? I mean, I would. I, I love ninjas. Well, summarise better, but ninjas are really good. Um, and so this is the kind of interface you'll see inside um, the plain community. Now, we did use the badge bill um, software as a service, and, and, um, and that was an interesting exercise in itself. Um, and certainly gave me a lot of opportunity to think through the value of the visual um, tracking and leaderboards and other things. And, and we won't have time to go into here, but leaderboards can be as good for uh, game-inspired learning as they can be bad. And they need to be thought very around very carefully. Uh, but you can see the kinds of badges and missions we had, the kind of way you tracked things. And, and a lot of our teachers said, this is really fantastic when I was so close to achieving that, that level or that badge. It just pushed me over the edge to finish that task and, and to get things going. But what we did in this, uh, the plan was for the higher levels, like that um, Bettendorf work, was to have participatory design so that our members would be designing uh, further missions, that teachers would be able to social gift badges to each other. So that top thought leader badge down there was one that I could have given someone I thought really inspired my thinking. And so I could, I could gift that badge to a person to be part of their um, identity in the, in the program. So lots of juicy things surrounding um, the activity in, in this community. Um, and I, that's the one that I worked on, specifically worked on the design. The other cases I've given you are ones that I've case studied and, um, and admire immensely. If you want to, and the reason I've got this graphic up is Amy Jo Kim suggests that the player has a journey through any game. And it begins with onboarding, uh, develops into habit building, and moves you, that habit building moves you toward mastery. Now, what I'm seeing that I think is really interesting is that game inspired or, or game gamification, if you like, seems to have a very high strength in onboarding, in getting people into your, um, your way of thinking, your way of learning, the project you want, um, getting them to engage, um, to build a disposition. So, and, and, and I think it somewhat concerns me in the gamification arena that people are seeing that success in the onboarding stage and projecting that on to all the other levels. Now, um, I think we could loosely say uh, learning is, is um, the same trajectory, onboarding, some habit building about learning and then mastery of a topic. Um, so I think we want to, ha I just want to, say that I think onboarding or that getting people on board is a really great place to look at starting a game inspired program. But I want to just add a note of caution that I think people are projecting from that um, a level of sustainability that may not be true. And a lot of the programs are not mature enough. I mean I tried the ones the examples I've shown you are all um, two and three years um, in in the making. Um, with the exception of the Velvet Throne, which is very juicy and new. Um, so if you're thinking about a project at that onboarding level, it's a really good place to start experimenting with some game-inspired um, context or some game-inspired approach. If you want to follow up on any of the projects that I've talked about, then these are the people you need to talk to. So Amy Baskin with the Grammar Olympics, Natalie Denmead with the Velvet Throne, Liz Lawley at for Just Press Play, uh, Chris Light uh, for Mission Possible, and myself uh, for Plain or for general questions about game inspired or gamification. And so I'd just like to throw it open to questions now and let's have a bit of a conversation. I try to power through as fast as I could. Sure. So if you have a question for Bron, you can put it in the chat. Uh, or we'll turn on the microphones here and you can just click on the talk button that is at the top of the, uh, above the chat or in the audio and video area. And 
Ron, I did see a question I thought that went by. Let's see if I can find it again. Uh, while you're doing that, I'll just answer Peggy said, that's a scary part, how long it takes to create really good games. And it does, but I think you, you, we have to set aside the idea that we're creating an entire game. And I think that that's kind of a, a blocker. But start with a few things that you might add. I'm working um, in, in a group here looking at uh, the open badges system, and that's the only element they're looking at as badges. Um, you might be starting there, you might be starting somewhere um, in just throwing open a narrative, like the Velvet Throne has a very rich narrative to the, the play. Um, but it's still all the same content it, and, and the students have engaged. They created all the visual content that you saw, but it's Natalie who did the game thinking behind it. Um, and, and she was saying that it was really interesting that it's been quite agile. She, she didn't have it all mapped out in her head. She just thought this would be a great way to engage these um, disenfranchised students in a, in a small country town um, and get them really excited about um, learning. And so each week she's been adding to it and expanding it and talking it through with the students. Um, at one stage she tried to give an award to a student and the students complained that they didn't know that award was on, on the offering or they would have all aspired to it and they wouldn't let her give that award to somebody. They didn't feel that it had been mapped out as they were at, at, in the beginning. So it was really interesting her students have had a lot of say in how she's developed that. Are you seeing the questions in the chat or do you want me to feed them to you? I can see the question about the plane. Plane was a federally funded project. I designed the gamification, um, the game inspired process inside it, and we used the Badgeville interface to actually collect and record points and um, and do all of that. And if you want to follow up on that, there, there is a video, a YouTube video, with me explaining much more about the the um, the project. So if you just search uh, Bronwyn Stucky and um, Gamification on YouTube, you'll find it. Now and let me see. Do you have a one above of that? Do you Do find I have the, go, ahead. go ahead. Do you find the pre perceived negative feelings about gamification will shift with time as people understand it better? Well, there's a, a whole bunch of things there. I think. Um, the reason I focus on professional learning because that's the space I work in. But I think if teachers had a taste, and I see this from the playing community, when teachers had a taste of what a game-inspired approach might be, you could see them starting to think, wow, well, I could be doing this in my classroom. You know, I could, I could try this in my classroom. Um, so actually having that experience, more than knowing about it, uh, and theorizing about it, I think if we actually start focusing in more on our professional learning experiences and where a need is signaled, being able to apply some of those those game atoms to our professional learning. And heavens knows we could really do some improvement on, um, on professional learning. Um, I noticed there was a post on Facebook from some uh, from a colleague of mine in America who said, um, if I die, please let it be at a professional, at, at a teacher training, professional learning experience, and the segue between life and death will not be as, as grand. Um, you know, it's kind of, um, that's how a lot of people feel about professional learning. We're like those 16 year olds in the country town that a lot of our professional learning is, is not inspiring and engaging and doesn't give us great feedback and doesn't um, give us a personal ownership of the trajectory that we're going to take through the learning. We're all sitting through some lockstep process and that's all of what we tell, we tell teachers is inappropriate for kids. Um, so we need to experience that for ourselves. Okay, the, a couple of questions have come in. Uh, Leon asks, any examples you know of where students build the actual games a la scratch but a bit more polished? Well, um, I actually don't work in, very much in the student arena, but I know that if you tune in to No Clues, um, no Clues Keynote tomorrow, that you will get a really good handle on student design of the games. Um, 
as I said, with the example with the Velvet Throne, the students had a lot of say in how that was developing. Um, in plain, we were working towards participatory design. Um, I don't see that there's any reason that students couldn't do that. And I know Yvonne Harrison, who's here today, also, um, like no clue, working in Minecraft, has had students design the game that um, the rest of their classmates would play. Um, so I think there's no reason it can't happen. And in fact, students will probably take less time to get on board with the concept than us as teachers. But we do have to play some spaces to get an idea what game atoms are. And you know, I, it really annoys me when people hone in on point stages and leaderboards. I mean, what are they worth? What are those points worth? What do you do with them? If the actual learning they're engaging in isn't meaningful, points won't sustain any kind of activity. So you know, you've got to come back to doing good teaching and learning, but how can um, those game atoms help us do that better. I thought, uh, yes, I'll, I'll, go ahead. I was just giving a big plug for no clue, who I think will much more adequately answer that question than myself. I thought what was interesting in Peggy Sheehy's session was she said that game designers know what engages people. And I thought, well, I'm not sure it's that they know, but it's that they're willing to find out and so how much is experimentation a part of this process? Oh, I think it's huge. And, and, but game designers are prepared to wind back really quickly if something doesn't work. And they have that whole fail forward concept when they're designing. You know, they're, they're constantly designing testing, doing user testing, you know, designing testing. Um, they know who their players are and they know what's going to work with them. But they also know to ditch something if it doesn't work. But they're not frightened to fail. Um, and indeed, it's part of, part of what they do to test out a new idea, to find a new way. They're working in a very competitive market. And uh, keep getting players and keeping players is you know, um, a, a big thing for them. And I know Jim G says in, in many cases, game designers do know more about um, what it takes to get learners to do very difficult things to work in a very sustained way and to have a great sense of accomplishment than many of us as educators might do. Um, the interesting thing is I don't, games are not new. Um, teachers, are, teachers are good teachers, professional teachers have used games in their teaching for a long while. It's just this whole move into digital um, is that big jump, is the leap that, that we need to take. But if you look at the Grammar Olympics, that was all physical and fun and they had a card and they had stickers and a gold medal that they all got. And if you go watch the video, it's really cute. It's very fun. The kids enjoyed it. And, and when I say kids, these are college students. But it really brought home the fact that, that grammar was important to them and that they could engage with that learning. Um, so I think, you know, it doesn't have to be digital, but I think that's the, the block. Because I think innately, professional teachers understand the idea of game um, and game atoms and game elements and, you know, challenge-based learning, but it's when you add the digital context that it becomes um, something else. Peggy asked earlier, but it scrolled up, is it practical to start with students helping you to design a game if you as the teacher only have an idea about the purpose and very little knowledge experience designing games. She says, you make it sound so easy. I think that would be absolutely a great place to start, is to talk about the games they play, what things they think are fun, pick a topic in and experiment with the kids on how you could reframe that. Um, Toss out everything that you know already and go back to basics. What is the goal? of that learning. And if, if you hold your goal steadfast, how you get there can be very different. I think what we're trying to do with um, gamification in a lot of contexts is, is to layer it over things that exist or to change marginal things. Rather than stepping back to basics and saying, okay, well, let's throw it all out. Here's the goal. We want to learn to use grammar. How can we do that? How, or we, the goal is to have a better disposition towards this. Or the goal is to learn, you know, um, 
this aspect of science or the scientific method. Okay, that's the goal. How do we get there in a fun way? And there's no reason a teacher couldn't design that with students. It just depends on how, uh, how much you can initiate. You may have a basic idea to start, but I think teachers do have to play a few more games themselves to understand what a game atom is. You know, um, you have to learn a little bit of science to know what an atom is in the first place. So you do have to play uh, some games, um, whatever they are, and then deconstruct in your mind what was it about that that made it engaging. Um, but that starting from a need is the big thing for me. Don't just ice it on. You need to think about are you trying, is it the learner's need? Is the topic not intrinsically interesting? Are you bringing in a new initiative? What is it that's going to trigger this want to rethink something? I think you're probably answering it, but Lene asked, what suggestions would you have for getting started with gaming in an online high school class when less than 50% of the students actually attend or engage? Well, that's a really interesting point because um, Natalie, who did the Velvet Throne, has issues with students and attendance as well. Um, even though this is, uh, they've signed up for this course, it's not compulsory, the compulsory years of schooling. Um, and, and her approach has been very successful. And as I said, she didn't know very much about Game of Thrones, but could pick up on what, what it was about games. I, I think starting with the narrative is a great way to do it and, 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 and giving some recognition back to the students for what they're doing, what they're engaging in. Um, maybe as Peggy said, sit down and, and, and with the students say, how could we design this to be more like a game? So don't say that you're designing a game because like, that is another thing that really I think is um, not the right way to start thinking because you're not designing a game. Designing a game is a really, really um, different set of skills. What we're doing is designing a learning experience that's game inspired. Um, so how can we bring game ideas into it? And kids can very quickly give you some ideas to get started with that. But the, I would pick a need. I would pick something smaller in your curriculum that you may feel isn't as well received as it could be. Um, in the case of you've got learners who don't attend, well, maybe you want to make it so that they can be doing it online, being at school when they're not at school. Um, if you make the the um, activity so they can ga engage away from the school, maybe you'll entice them to be part of engaging the content even though they're not engaging in physically being in the classroom. Um, I think there are lots of spaces there. We just don't know enough about what will work, but we won't know if we don't experiment with them. And if teachers don't also publish about what it is they've done, um, the what's and all story of, of how you approached it. But I'd certainly love to have a conversation with, who asked that question? Lene, um, or was it Annette? But if you'd like to follow up with me, I'd really love to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you about that and think through something that we might be able to um, kick off. That was Lene. Hey, did you see Jackie's comment? She said, maybe teachers just need to go out to the playground and play with the kids. Visceral experience, the joy of play. Absolutely, absolutely. Playing with kids instead of policing kids' play, and that's a very different space. And, and Mary Ann will talk a great deal about this in her keynote tomorrow. Um, but yeah, we need to play with kids as a co a co learner, as a just another player. That horizontal learning that we can do when we're just out there as another one of the kids. Um, and and yeah, it doesn't have to be digital play. Understanding play and the sheer pleasure of it um, is a great way to go. We, we had a, an event here in Sydney called Teachers in Front, which I'm engaging in with colleague Dean Groom. And as part of the day, we got everyone to do Just Dance on the Wii. Um, and, and we got you know, some of these tough guys who don't, I don't dance, um, to get up and, and kind of pressured them in. Okay, we went against them, don't make it mandatory. Um, but we got them up to dance just to, uh, 
a leveller to laugh together, to release endorphins, to actually just move away from the thinking space into a physical fun space for a little while. And it was a really, uh, uh, there was a lovely energy after we'd all been through that. So, um, and it was a shared experience where we all laughed together. Um, and I think teachers could do more of that with their students. The problem is what I see, um, and the same for parents, parents could do more of that with their children. Interestingly, parents will play Monopoly with their kids in Twister and, um, and other games, um, Uno or, or whatever, but then they don't sit down and play the digital games with their kids. Um, they seem to find them more as babysitting um, and the child's quietly playing something on the iPad instead of sitting down and engaging in the play. And I think that's important but not as police. Too many times I see parents and teachers say they're playing with the kids, but what they're really doing is policing the kids' action rather than actually play like a 10-year-old, be like a 10-year-old, play with your, with your children. I'd love to hear your story, Sasha. Have you got a microphone? I've given everybody a microphone. So Hi, there this you is go. Sasha. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, I forgot. I muted my speakers. One second. Okay, I should be able to hear you. We do hear you. Yes, we hear okay. you. Okay. Uh, my game is called Math Mart. It's based off of Walmart. And I'm in my second year. Uh, I'm also a new special ed math teacher. But I've been following gamification for several years. And I'm an IT professional for the last 13. I uh, started low tech because over 50% of my, 50 of my students did not have regular access to a computer. So all of my uh, any badges I have, any uh, progress that I use is all on my walls. And uh, I do use uh, Edmodo.com. And I've increased my use of Google applications, uh, teaching the kids Google Docs, uh, using Google Plus as a community and you having them use resources that we find all over the web. That's great, Sasha. And I see someone is it, people have asked is there a link to your an explanation of your game? Uh, I have a couple. Links, I'll go ahead and put them up for uh, on uh, Google Plus so people can take a look. Brilliant. And if anyone else has a, a game inspired approach that they're using and they'd like to let us know, that would be fantastic. I'd, I'd love for you to take the mic. I'd also like to ask Tony are there questions from your students in the room? I know that Jackie mentions outdoor cooperative games. When I was in a classroom last, um, I carted around with me for about five years a parachute, um, which I used for a load of outdoor cooperative games, and, um, and it was, you know, my most prized possession. Um, so I, I think we, we have to remember that physical games and physical play can be just as much a part of um, our game-inspired approach. It doesn't have to be sitting at a screen. But I note um, from what Sasha said as well, we don't have to have um, expensive tools to do this. We can be using the Edmodo, the Twitter, the, um, the uh, Google tools that we already have in our classrooms to be framing um, what, what it is we do. Um, I, I ran a professional development program um, in um, 
just a short session with teachers, and we just got teachers to use Twitter to give each other a plus one whenever they felt someone else contributed to their learning during the day, and we just had a book prize um, at the end of the day for the for the person who had um, supported the others in their learning the most, and that was just one tiny little attribute we added to the day. Um, and Twitter was important because people could just throw that in when they thought about it during the day. Um, so you don't have to be thinking large scale. I know I've shown you five programs that are um, fully fleshed, but I don't think you need to be thinking about um, a huge program or a huge change. So starting small is always a good way and starting with a real need. And if you wanted to, I know Chris Like will give away the infrastructure for what they've done in Mission Possible. I know that um, Just Press Play is going to be, is, is, may already be available for people who want to use that. Um, so there are uh, lots of uh, people who are, this is a space where people are very generous with their knowledge and their expertise. Any platform they can start with. I do know a lot of people building game-inspired spaces in Edmodo. Um, a, a friend of mine who teaches English, who did um, a Game of Thrones approach, uh, no, not Game of Thrones, a um, Hunger Games approach to a, a part of her curriculum, and she used Edmodo for that. And if anyone would be interested in that, I can certainly pass that on. That's Bianca Hughes, H-E-W. Um, I'm put her name in here. She's in, in Australia here in Sydney, teaches high school English. Um, and, uh, but she, and she and a number of other people, we've had conversations about how adaptable Edmodo is for building a, um, a challenge-based uh, or mission-based learning system. Brian, shall we wrap it up? I'm very happy to do so. If anyone wants to follow up with me, um, um, I had to put my... Oh, what a great photo. <laughs> <laughs> I had to put that in. I mean, I have to use it somewhere. Um, if you want to follow up with me about any of this, and if, you're, if you've got a game, I'm always on the hunt for new examples. So, Sasha, I'd love to talk to you more. Um, and Tony, to your students, if they've got ideas there, anyone who's, or Linnae, if you've got one, an idea to start, um, I love to include new cases, and they don't have to be fully formed. It could just be you, you've got an idea for something, and, and you want to demonstrate the need that goes with that. So um, I would love to follow up with anyone who's interested. Thanks, Brad. I'm clapping for you. It's hard to find the clapping button now, but it's under the smiley face in the participant window. You click applause. Thank well, you so much for switching time. Oh, no, thank you for being so accommodating. This is a great event, and I hope everyone has a, a fabulous week thinking games and game-inspired learning. Thanks, Bron. Thanks, everybody. Uh, tomorrow, more fun. The week continues our inaugural Gaming and Ed conference. Take care. Have a good night or day. Bye now.